Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name And on that day When my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise on ending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name sing like never before oh my soul I wish you your whole name I will wish you your whole name I will worship your whole
There are many ways we collaborate with each other to be the church we're called to be and to serve how we serve. And our contributing financially is one of the most important of those ways. If you want to help fund and sustain what we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org contribute to see the many simple ways that you can do so. You can even text CrosspointNC to 77977 to receive a link to get started now. Thank you for your partnership in the work we do together.
One thing I admire about this congregation, uh, one thing I have learned so much from you, is how to show up in the world for the sake of love and justice. I have witnessed how hard you work, how much you give of yourselves, how much you strive together and individually to cultivate hope, to alleviate suffering, to encourage the next generation, to nourish possibility, to create generous space, uh, to make a better world. You have taught me so much together and individually about love in action, about fostering beauty, about embodying goodness. You all do so much. And that's what I want to discuss today. You all do so much, and it always seems as if there's always still more to be done. You all do so much, and it's true, there's always one more crisis to attend to, one more worry to address, one more mouth to feed, one more person to meet in the midst of whatever they're experiencing, whether it's your kid who's being bullied at school or your neighbor who's experienced a loss or your friend who needs a listening ear or a family halfway around the world who will benefit from a donation in the midst of war and famine or an acquaintance who could use an encouraging word on social media or an event that needs a volunteer or someone else who needs something or other. You all do so much together and individually and still there is always so much to be done. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus has been preaching and teaching, and the word has been spreading about him and his miracles. He has been healing and caring, and he's even recruited the disciples to help him with his ministry. He and they are all doing so much. And still, there is always so much to be done. Listen for what God might have to say to God's people through this ancient story. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell face down and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. Do not tell anyone, Jesus instructed him, but go, show yourself to the priest and present the offering Moses prescribed for your cleansing as a testimony to them. But the news about Jesus spread all the more and great crowds came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Yet he frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Uh, One thing I love about stories like these is that they invite us to imagine them from all different sides and even to find ourselves in them. What might it have been like to witness this scene? Maybe as a curious bystander. I imagine that space would emerge around this man like a parting in the midst of a bodily sea as he approached Jesus. After all, lepers were outcasts, considered unclean. Nobody would want to get too close. And then he prostrates himself in the dirt, throws himself down onto the ground before this teacher of great renown. If you saw this unfold, Would you think it was bizarre, hopeful, curious? How might it have felt to be the man with leprosy? It isn't easy to understand the weight of what he must have been carrying on his weary shoulders. And it's even more difficult to know which was harder, the physical effects of his illness or the emotional and psychological ones. How do you even rank suffering? Leprosy, which is now known as Hansen's disease, can cause intense joint pain, nerve damage, and muscle weakness. It can also disfigure a person, marking them out as alien. In that day, someone with the condition just wasn't allowed to belong. 
And I imagine that re-entry into society might not have been the easiest thing either, given the severity of his condition. Wouldn't his neighbors ask whether he had really been healed? Wouldn't his family be skeptical about whether he was really clean? And what about the priest to whom Jesus sends the healed man? What is he to make of this allegedly cleansed person? He might have had some questions too about what exactly had happened. I also think about Jesus. Jesus who enters this tired and angry world and delves heart first into meeting that weariness and with supernatural patience addresses the rage. Jesus who encounters so many people in the midst of their suffering and their grief in their deep hunger and their profound thirst. Jesus who finds himself among these overwhelming crowds clamoring for his attention and crying out for his care. Jesus who is surely exhausted from the travel and still seems able to summon the energy to meet more people, to offer more healing, to greet folks where they are, to give them some healing, to kindle some hope. One thing I love about stories like these is they invite us to imagine them from all different sides and we get to empathize and even try to find a bit of resonance between our stories and theirs. I suspect you wouldn't be here, for instance, if you couldn't relate to the man with leprosy at least a little. All of us, I suspect, have struggled with something that ails us whether it's in our physical bodies or in our souls. All of us, I would guess, have battled something that breeds isolation, some secret perhaps that if it were known, if it were public, would mark us out as unworthy. All of us, I think, uh, know how it feels to want to be seen personally, especially by the one who was love incarnate. All of us, I imagine, have sought healing and even belonging. And I mentioned belonging because if you look back over all the different kinds of healing that Jesus does over and over, it's not just the physical that Jesus heals, it's the social. Over and over, he removes the thing that separates the suffering one from community. Over and over, he returns them to belonging. Over and over, he then urges them to testify to what has been done to them and for them, to share some of that good, good news. It's intriguing to me that Jesus instructs the healed man not to tell anyone, but to go to the priest and to make an offering at the temple. I have wrestled with this some, and I don't think that the point is that Jesus wants the man to keep the story to himself. No, I think Jesus wants the man not to be distracted from asserting his full belonging and reclaiming his place among his people. As if to say in an embodied way to the powers that be, I have been cleansed by a power greater than you and nothing can keep me from community any longer. Though he might have been marginalized by society, Jesus sends the man back into that society to embody good news. I think I see something of the healed leper in you. I have witnessed how you offer those around you some of the balm that you too have received. And in doing so, you have embodied good news too. And that's not to say that you're not here uh, looking for a little more solace, a little more comfort, a little more hope for yourself too. And that's certainly not to say that you are perfect or even close. Our faith isn't a straight one and done. We are works in sacred progress. Still, I've observed how you together and individually have both tasted healing and offered it to those around you. In these ways, you have pointed people to Jesus and to Jesus's love. In that way, I also see something of Jesus in you. You all have done so much together and individually, 
and you do so much. And still there is always so much to be done. Which is why I think the next part of this passage is so utterly crucial. And I want to read verse 16 of Luke 5 for us again, because this is where I want to spend the rest of our time. Yet Jesus frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. You all have done so much together and individually, and you do so much. And still there's always so much to be done. So how do you push through? What will enable you to make it? Whatever make it means. Where will, where will you find the patience and the grace, the strength and the fortitude, the empathy and the love to keep doing what you're doing for the sake of this aching world? So let me read that verse again. Yet Jesus frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray. So let's then unpack this. Uh, the first part, yet he frequently withdrew to the wilderness. I think this is especially good news and gospel truth to those of us who are introverts like me. But all of us, even you irrepressible extroverts, you need rest and you need respite. Even at the best of times, you cannot meet all the needs of all those around you. Not your partners and your spouses, not your kids with their packed schedules, not your kids and your kids' friends with their insatiable appetites, not your parents with their, I don't know, passive aggressiveness or their judgments or their longing for respect, not your families with their preconceived notions, not your friends with their desire to be seen, not all those neighbors known and unknown near and far who are suffering in their own ways. Anyway, the call on your life together and individually. The call on your life was never to offer your personal solution for every problem. The call was and is and will be to be faithful and to show up as your best, most loving self. But how can you possibly be your best, most loving self without rest and without respite? Even Jesus couldn't. Even God's very self needed a break. Even God, who is love incarnate, needed to frequently withdraw, as this verse tells us. And this is good news. There's a complication here, though. All this good news comes with a hard reality, too. Uh, scripture records so many healings, so many miracles that Jesus performed. But what about the people who didn't get healed? What about the ones who were still suffering and couldn't join the crowds? And what about those who died while Jesus withdrew to said wilderness? <laughs> I've really been wrestling with this conundrum, and here's where I've landed. Uh, Jesus didn't go to his room. He didn't hide in a hermit's cell. He didn't head to the beach. He went to the wilderness. He went out where nobody else wanted to be, where jackals and snakes are home. And I think there's something important here. I don't think Luke included this detail casually. And the biblical wilderness is a complicated concept because it at once suggests barrenness and opportunity. It is a place where the desperate go, and it's a place where God meets the desperate. It's a space where nourishment can be difficult to find, and it is a space where God provides. I see Jesus out there as the sun sears. Only when it's wildly hot can you understand the grace of shade. The clouds dance across the sky, and maybe the breeze picks up a little bit, and there, skittering under a rock, is a lizard. Only when you're still do you notice all that movement. I picture Jesus out there as night falls and the stars arise and the constellations make themselves visible. Only in the darkness can you glimpse some sources of light. A fly buzzes. The wind whistles past the boulders. Only in the quiet do you hear just how loud nature can be. I imagine Jesus out there taking 
all this in, absent the distractions of the loud crowds and the noisy clamor, and present to the reality of the creator God's handiwork. Only in these moments of attention can you remember all that God has made and notice all that God is still remaking. Yet frequently he withdrew, it says, but not into nothingness. Because the wilderness may be wild to some, but it's home to others. Home to the insects and home to the ever-flowing spring. Home to the birds and home to the jackals. Home to all who are sustained purely by God's provision. And home to all who are nourished just by God's hand. For some of us, the wilderness can seem harsh, yes, but it also has its own soft side. In the wilderness, one witnesses God's unusual, incomprehensible timing. It can seem so desolate for so long, and then when in, with an unexpected rain, it bursts into sudden and furious bloom, surprising carpets of dormant flower rolled out just under the right conditions. And all this, all this together preaches a thousand sermons about all that we can't know, about all that is beyond our control, about all that unfolds in the fullness of God's own time. Yet frequently he withdrew, it says, but maybe he did it because he needed to be reminded of the interconnectedness of it all, the intricacies of it all, the grace of it all, and his fully human limits in the midst of it all. If Jesus was born fully divine, and fully human, as historic Christianity traditionally has held, his full humanity must have meant that he also had to reckon with his limits. Only 24 hours to a day, only so much energy, only so much capacity, only so much strength, only so much ability. Yet frequently he withdrew, it says. But maybe he did it because he needed to see again that faithfulness called him to do what he could and to acknowledge what he couldn't. That some things would be redeemed in another way, at another time, in another place, in another space. Yet frequently he withdrew to the wilderness to pray, it says. Not to knit or to worry, not to write or to sing, not to post on social media or to hike, although it's not out of the question that he did those other things too, well, except for the social media one. And yet frequently he withdrew to the wilderness to pray. I suspect that prayer isn't exactly what some of us were brought up to believe it to be. You don't have to bow your head to pray though you can. Uh, you don't have to close your eyes to pray, though you can. You don't have to fall to your knees or clasp your hands to pray, though you can. Uh, you don't have to say Father God in every sentence, as some people in my college youth group tended to do, as if God would forget you were talking, though you can. To pray is simply to be in conversation with the divine. And sometimes you might have a question, sometimes you might have an observation, sometimes you might have a barely formed and incomplete thought. Sometimes you might have a request. Sometimes you might just sit there and picture God simply being present, and that can be prayer too. The great French theologian Simone Weil wrote, attention taken to the highest degree is the same thing as prayer. Absolute unmixed attention is prayer. Prayer takes attention, and prayer is attention. So when I read that Jesus frequently withdrew to the wilderness to pray, I imagine him paying attention, paying attention to his needs, paying attention to his limits, paying attention to the desert air and how it warmed in the sunshine and cooled under the moon paying attention to how he felt about everything that had happened amidst the crowds, paying attention to the dynamics among his band of disciples, paying attention to where and how the spirit might be moving him to act or not whenever he was ready to return to the city. To pay attention 
and to pray can be a way of sifting through the debris of all that has come before, to pay attention, to pray, can be a method of recuperating from the costly work of ministry, to pay attention, to pray, can be an act of recognizing your limits and also acknowledging the boundlessness and the mystery of God, God's timetable, God's plans, God's movements, God's noted presence, as well as God's perceived absence. To pay attention, to pray, can be a means of regathering yourself and returning yourself to God's love and simply being God's beloved. Note that I said being God's beloved. Uh, this congregation talks so much about doing, and I love it, and I've benefited from it, and I am grateful for it, and I honor it. But I also want you to remember that doing is not the same as being. To be who you are is to show up for others, yes, but it's also to be who God made you to be, which is simply a beloved child of the divine, a bearer of beauty, and a witness to hope. To be who you are is to return in your hearts to that love, to be reminded of it once again, to nurture your connection to goodness. To be who you are is to be motivated by your gratitude, yes, of course, but it's also simply to rest, to rest as a much loved recipient of grace. I'm so confident that you will continue to show up in the world for the sake of love and justice, in big ways and small ways, together and individually. And as you do that, I never want you to lose perspective. I never want you to forget the love that beats at the heart of all of it. That's all. You are loved. We all need reminding sometimes especially amidst the whirl of the world and the endless demands on our time and energy, we all need reminding that we are loved just as we are and just as we are becoming. Do not forget, dear ones, that you are so deeply and powerfully loved, above all by the one who made you, the one who redeemed you, and the one who accompanies you all along the way. That is why we come to the table too, to the table of the Lord, to be reminded of that embodied incarnational love, the bread of life and the cup of blessing. In those elements and at this table, we get a taste of God's love, imaginative love, sacrificial love, steadfast love. So come beloveds, come and feast and remember that you are loved. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home 